I think I did with everybody I started working with in the 60s. Every mother and father, mom who went with my mother at the period in the hospital. My mother was a maid and scrubbed floors. The, the patron, the matron used to say, oh, you stay at a corner, I can see the floors are shining. That was my mother. Yes. And, and so I was, sitting, I was sitting and thinking to her, I said, you know, I think the most surreal thing about today is we are on, in this theatre here, named John Khan Theatre. So in 1942, in Brighton when you were born, did you think you would be here in your, in a, in a theatre named after you? Yes. <laughs> Grow up in township. The only thing that keeps you alive is the dream of a better life. Hallelujah. If you dream that God has to talk to me, what's going on now in my life in New Brighton can't be it anymore. I ask God, you're going to have a plan for me. There's going to be much, much more than this. And, and that dream was, I think this theater here was the theater of many of your dreams. And this wasn't always a theater when you were growing up. Oh no, this was the fruit and vegetable market. <laughs> also, were you a fruiter? I didn't know, I didn't realize. No, actually, um, uh, the CEO of this theatre now, Ishmael Mohammed, <laughs> his uncle, was one of the, 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 the stall holders who, who are the names on those boards who used to come here and buy fruits and vegetables and sell them to black people and colored people and Indian people in Mayfair. I was born in Port Elizabeth in New Bright. Johannesburg was too far for us. We always dreamt that one day I'll go to Johannesburg. But what was more stronger in New Brighton, in the Eastern Cape, was the unwillingness to accept that we were inferior and that was our fate. We had to challenge it, even if when our parents were saying, I'm done, I'm, this is God's way. We changed and changes. <laughs> of this place which used to sell uh, vegetables and fruit gave you the opportunity to protest against such uh, injustices. When and this, they also protected you. This place, when it was about to be demolished in 1976, uh, Barney Simon, the artistic director and founder of the Market Theatre Company, people like Vanessa, who Danny Keo and uh, it's a bit as they denote, based out of the company. And they needed a place to work in. Many men who was then working at the State Theatre at Victoria, they got together and took over the building to create a platform where all artists of every shade, shape, sex, whatever, could come on this platform and look at each other and tell stories that made them feel that they're human beings with dignity and integrity and demanded respect. I like what you said. You said, uh, you said this place here was a place to exchange money for goods, but for people like you, it was a place to exchange ideas. This is exactly what we started. When I came uh, here, we wanted to create an exciting space. We brought all the artists of South Africa. They came here. We black actors were very fortunate. Uh, we're not in Rob, we only been detained, which was a great thing. Anyway, when you detain, you suddenly accept it as a comrade. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge was more for white actors who felt that the, the public saw them as betraying their own folk by working at this place which was a place that was exposing the inhumanity and the injustice and the own hell of apartheid. So we went back to a community that praised us. And I used to think about especially who the relationship with. And these are the people that went back to the white servants. 
and be asked, what are you doing? Why are you allowing yourself to be used by those blacks in order to create a protest revolution? You will never, never liberate this country. So the greater thanks for me and the greater contribution is to those people like who came to this place, who went to us. But I want to go back now. I want to, I want to go back a little bit to on your career. Now, somebody told me you're a big, you're quite big with motor vehicles. Like you can put together an engine from start to, you know, I've had a few breakdowns up. And I said, where is John Kanye? <laughs> <laughs> well, I passed my metric and I got a, uh, I've been accepted at Fort Wayne University to go and study law. Uh, I see Uman Tatisani, we were in the same group. No Bobani Pichana, no Dono Bani Delisa. We were all going to go study at Fort Wayne. Uh, and my uncle Harry, you know, who was like my elder brother, got himself involved with those Kapoko and his politics. <laughs> and my father then came back from his trial in Ramsdown, looked me in the eye and said, I'm sorry. <laughs> you won't be able to go to university. I don't have the money. And there were 11 of us at home. Mom and Dad never read the pamphlet of family planning. Don't team is, of course, there's another no, 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 no. My father saw children as an investment. <laughs> and, and, and not an investment in a metaphorical way, a real investment. Yeah. He wanted his money back. <laughs> And he told us quite clearly that I want my money back. So I decided yes. I'm going to work, I'm going to put money aside. So I got a job at Ford Motor Company assembling engines for 7 rand 42 cents a week. And I had to give it to my dad because he said, You don't drink, you don't smoke, what are you going to do with the money? <laughs> I wanted to say, I'm on Kazanaya in the east. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you didn't last that fort. Of course, I think you got fired. No, what happened was. Oh, yeah, sorry, did I put it too rough? The way the, what happened was, I, I <laughs> was told to the personnel office, the very educated, the matrix did get very good English. Uh, in the future, I would like to have you in the personnel office. But at the, main t at the meantime, there is a position in maintenance. It sounded so English. <laughs> you know, Bonnie Pichan was standing behind me, and we both agreed we were going to do maintenance. So when we walked into the factory, Bonnie was given a paintbrush and a rope. He was hanging about 40 meters in the sky, painting the roof. I was given a toilet brush, a bucket, and a mop. And then I realized. Then, of course, I um, managed to get myself out of that, and I was on the assembly line. Then I met uh, uh, in 1965, <coughs> after Hugo. Winston John and I were at school together. We, were, we did plays at school, because we did, I didn't want to play rugby. Uh, I, I was, <laughs> we talk about rugby. Later. No, we didn't want to play rugby. Winston was sportsman, Victor Ludon, in tennis, in in cricket, in everything, but he was my good friend. So then we decided with Winston that we want to put a little bit of effort in making theater and to make it professional. We met with Arthur and we asked him if he could work with us to create plays. We didn't want to do an regulated play. It was then that we were working on a project with Winston that Winston told us of the story of a man who went to a photograph studio downtown, the Bank Photograph Studio. You know those photographs where you stand next to a plastic flower and flowers <laughs> and a telephone. And the man had a picture of himself with a cigarette and a pipe meat. And that was the birth of Cesar Vance in his day. But now you were doing you were doing this while you were working at Fort. Yes, I was assembling engines. And Mouthy. I mean, uh, you had a bit of a, a point of view on how things should work or not work. Well, because I could speak Afrikaans, and there was one day this big fight between Ufarawandoya and with Mr. Nivot. Mr. Nivot is swearing at him, and Udoto can't speak English. 
So I'm now called in to interpret and to solve the one. So Mr. Nebo they can many steward me because but you can't touch me, I'm white. And Dorco says, it's a boy on the young. I know I didn't translate that. He's not very pleased at what I said. <laughs> so, as, as the one who speaks good English, yes. and then the white man says, Neman, the chassad for a Neman, a lepai. Because the booty blue. And then the understand that the man, a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a Nobody appeared at him. I think of them, and he's very angry. He said, He said, Your ma. What again, Google, I don't go, 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 But I love your brother Umeya. I just thought Umeya is how life should be. Because Umeya never quite uh, sat in the front of any car. You know, when you grow up in a big family, you, you assume the supreme responsibility simply because you're slightly successful than the others. Umeya is my eldest brother. Whenever my father would send us to go to buy anything from the stores, he would never sit in front. He sat at the back. And he would open the window of the British and head like this. <laughs> and that's why I called him Mayan. He was a mayor of Portuguese. Before that was before any white man, the black person became mayor of these dungeons, my brother was the first man. <laughs> oh, he was incredible. He was an incredible human being. He knew the deep sense. He understood the plight of the family. He worked three jobs a day to put us all through school, including my young brother, who's now Reverend Gannon, and my old sister, Queen and all. He took he knew that he had to step up and work. Work at bus parties, come back and work in the shop, come back on Saturdays, work in the gardens. You know, and he never complained once. And everything when I already become successful, as if I never do everything for him, he would be so surprised. Why am I saying thank you? He doesn't understand what's the fuss about. <coughs> Because he did what he believed was right. And without him, none of us in my family would have gone beyond standard six, let alone grade nine of intimate. <laughs> <laughs> so, on a more serious note, um, your, your play, Nothing But the Truth, was inspired by a tragedy uh, 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 around uh, that time, your brother told me. It was in 1985. My younger brother was a poet of the struggle. He was more ben African, he said, more militant. He always said to me, you, 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 you hustle too much, listen to these white people. What's going to happen when the revolution comes? And he says, uh, and he would do these brilliant points. He then said to me, there was a funeral of a young girl who was killed by a tear gas canister. She was nine years old. And funerals those days, we used to hijack it and make the political rallies. So he was going to be reading his poems. The police arrived and told 10,000 people to disperse within five minutes. And they didn't have watches because they couldn't understand how long is five minutes. Because in 45 seconds, they started shooting, dispersing the crowd. And at the end of 45 seconds, there were four bodies lying on the ground. And only one had the name. Kolile, the brother of the famous John Kani, and three other youths. I went through my life in the arts. We went through the process of 
prove that reconciliation. I could tell you it's important to reconcile. I could tell you the process of TRC is good, but I could not place it on my life. I could ask you to forgive, but I couldn't ask myself to forgive. And every time I went back to Port Elizabeth, I always stand next to his grave and just, just feel what a waste. And then one day I decided to write a letter. That was now the year 2000. I wanted to say thank you. This is where we are now. Our democracy is a reality. The pillars of that democracy bound together by our constitution are now a reality. And out of that right that came up, the story that I paid tribute to him, which is nothing but the truth. And I see in the audience here one of the most beautiful performances given in that play by a young actress in Johannesburg. The first role was played by Dampi Sakete Tan. Unfortunately, Dampi Sakete died uh, during, in fact, during the pre, not in the preview, during the way we were moving in into the theater. She was very sick. And then I found a brilliant actress, Tati Michelle. Hey. Tati! Tati! She, under, she played the role of Sipo's daughter. The strength that is embodied in the African woman. It's said that we have to enable Michelle's brilliant poem. It pains me to find these men. I'm looking for these men. Men not because there are women, but just because they're men. Just because they're fathers. Just because they are sons. Just because they have been born by women. I sometimes say to myself, I tend to forget that my mother was a woman. And I tell my children, your mother was a woman. You were here because of that womb and that warmth and that liquid you spoke about. And it just makes me think, I need to study brain rewiring. <laughs> I need every man to pass through the brain rewire. If I find a fault, you will be rejected. <laughs> I had a tiny sense of your arrogance and your non-respect for women. I don't call it women abuse. I don't call it the victimization of women. I call it the violation of human rights. <laughs> Today and, uh, and the reason we're here today is really to celebrate uh, your incredible and incomparable career. And but uh, but the journey hasn't been so easy. It's, it's been a bit of a costly uh, uh, a journey. You know, I was uh, reflecting on uh, when uh, Karina Nair, who plays Alexa, and Nicholas Mukuna, who plays Figana in Sierra <laughs> Leone, uh, who kissed. Imagine a black guy and a white woman kissing. That brought back some. All memories for you. <laughs> <laughs> the problem of an abnormal society it makes normal habits <clears throat> look abnormal. Yes. There is nothing wrong as an actor, nothing wrong as a human being to create a piece of work which was written by Strindberg in 1888. And we performed Miss Julie in 1985, 98 years later. And South Africa got so angry in this theater that they walked out of the theater because Jean, the character I played, kissed uh, 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 Miss Julie. It wasn't so much Miss Julie, it was because it was Sandra Prince, the dawn, the blomiki for the Africans there, <laughs> pride of the folk. And of course, again, in Othello. When I was playing Othello here, and which I must say to Parker, what a brilliant performance was. Yes. And it was so warm to see the steps and remember that. I remember that the police stopped me and I was detained, and they asked me about who wrote this place at Othello, William Shakespeare. 
They said, who decided to do this play? And I thought, I'm going to get out of this, I'm an epic. I said, Barney Simon and many men have the bar. I just was cast in the road. And then the security said, in page seven, it says, he take her into his arms. You kissed her on her mouth. It doesn't say that here. Page 13, it says they embrace. You kissed her on her mouth. It doesn't say that. In page 12, when he comes out of the bedroom, when there's a fight, you almost were in nothing, and you're holding your head so close to her digits, you're also pushing them one side. <laughs> but sitting there, and I'm thinking, then God, the policeman read the play. <laughs> There's a leading South African actor, and, and when, when you listen to a lot of complaints by South African actors now, uh, certainly we'll come to Black Panther in a minute. Certainly before Black Panther, people say, Why do Black, why do non South Africans or non Africans play the leading man? Now, Morgan Freeman spoke to you before he played Mandela. What did you say to him? Did you say, But Morgan, come on, uh, Hooker brother, I can play Mandela? <laughs> well, you, you've got to separate the passion of the art expression and that Africa has to use the art to educate, to mold the society, to become a collective surface. We're still in that process. Once you go over the Atlantic into Hollywood and England, it's a business. It's just business, really. The question is, they want to do the long walk to freedom. Who would bring in $300 million investment? Simple, Morgan Freedom. James L. Jones, Al Pacino could play Mandela, and they would steal him. <laughs> so Morgan says to me, why were you not considered to play the role? And I said, I don't come with Warner Brothers' marketing budget, so you come with that. But anyway, he said, I quite uh, have a problem with the job. I said, what? He said, this man gets arrested in 1964, and he comes out in 1989. What do we do with all those years? <laughs> but this is the, the, the situation which we in South Africa, or on the continent, we have to understand until the black yuppies, until the money of South Africa is invested in the arts. Until then, we need to be able to play the role. Don't worry, we just gave the two stories, the Mandela story and the Nico story. Yes, because we've got all the others still we can do. <laughs> Matter of fact. Matter of fact, you've got an opportunity then to play Black Panther. But what is fascinating is not just the fact that you've got an opportunity to play a black character in a predominantly uh, black or Africa focused movie, but you introduced Isi Klosa into the because that was not part of the plan. Please, I mean, as the king of our country, we can talk about this. Was it just your <laughs> royal decree? Please, young actors, be careful of making suggestions. <laughs> there are certain levels that allow you to do that. <laughs> now, it started, it actually started with Captain America's Civil War. We are in a scene with Scarlett Johansson, Chet Bosman, and Chris Evans. And then they, Chris says, I'm sorry, uh, Your Majesty, I won't be able to attend the meeting. I have to leave. And Scarlett Johansson says, I'm so sorry. What happened? What happened? But if you need the Avengers, we'll always be on your side. Now she goes, now I've left the chat, it was supposed to be my son. Now the line simply is, I miss you, my son. I haven't seen you for a very long time. I said, Sorry to the director, why are we speaking English? We're both from Wakanda. I haven't seen my son for a hell of a long time. Surely I'll talk to him in my language. And then this language advisor, who's a Canadian woman, is going to give me advice on how to speak my language. She then says, well, you know the Tatar language? He says he misses him sometimes. 
I said, no, no, no. I wanted me to take the road. You know I come from Africa. So if Wakanda is in Africa, what would you say as the director? I said, I'll simply say, Unkabilenya, Unkabilenya. And then the Marvel producer who was on set said, that's it. <laughs> What's that language? I said, he, said, he said, that's now officially the indigenous language of Wakanda. Your father had 11 children. Uh, you, you pretty much almost got there. <laughs> so I did not <laughs> You pretty much almost got there. And when one speaks to your children, all those, uh, they all speak uh, reverently uh, 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 about you. Did you, and I mean, they are teachers, they are programmers, they are in advertising. You only managed to get one actor out of the whole family. <laughs> well, I, I blame there was a conspiracy going on there. I was not wise. When I was being with them on all the productions of this, I found used to hold the script. Learn my lines and move around. I didn't realize that I was messing because I thought he would take anything up. So in 2003, I'm going to New York to do nothing but the truth on Broadway, the Lincoln Center. He told me that he's going to university after he's passed his retreat. I said, What are you going to do? And he's had me talk about political science, industrial relations, and all those things, because you know I'm connected, you see. So oh, yes, <laughs> if, he, if, if he does that, I could talk to the president, I could talk to the ambassador, so that he works in the embassies abroad. So I was happy that he was going to do that. And then one night I called home, and my wife, Monday, said, well, Atanga would like to talk to you. And Atanga comes, he says on the phone, he says, Tata, I'm in. He said, great, way. Face of the wonderful drama. <laughs> but, you, know, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned some names in this conversation here, uh, but I'm sure some of these words will ring, will ring a bell with you. John, you are out 365 days of the year and you are only home for 10 days. Not you are just married to a house and to God here. <laughs> Does it ring a bell? <laughs> He would say such things. It has always been the biggest challenge of a working artist to be able to play the role of a father, of a husband, and of a neighbor, and a brother, and a sister. I would normally say to my family, if you see me and I'm standing next to you, I'm unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be away from you. I have to have you think and miss me and be angry that I'm afraid. Then I am working. I have a family that's very beautiful. Most of them are here now with my nieces and nephews and my wife, Mandy, my daughter, my son-in-law, the only one I like. I <laughs> <laughs> Mandy and I were having a chat. Uh, you know, yes, my well, I don't know whether we, you can't. I don't know when we weren't gossiping, but we're just chatting because you know, as a, as an international star, we get paid in dollars, so you always have a very big uh, bank balance. Uh, so of course. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Mandy, I mean, you would be grateful when things. Are that money is the root of all evil, that pride goes before a fall, that bullshit from the missionaries who did not want to give us the pride of achieving and being who we are. Yes! So, so when we were talking about Ashley, it was not so much the money. Actually talking more about uh, a shopping part. You know, uh, you know when you're out for three months or six months uh, in New York on stage, uh, girl go shopping. Mm -hmm. And when she goes shopping, and she brings all these things 
was asking, how does John react, react normally when he looks at these, uh, they are shopping? He says, John looks, goes first to the price tag. <laughs> That's <in> my name. <laughs> well, how do you put it, really? We have this fantastic thing, me and my wife. We are on the same text and everything. She, she knows exactly I'm negotiating the deal. I tell her what the offer is. We discuss the offer together before I can say to my agent, I see uh, Shona Billy is in the house, brilliant from MLA. She's an incredible agent from who looks at uh, Wesley's also here, who are also always, they tell you, when you start, sorry, you can't afford Dr. Carney, next. <laughs> so whenever we go overseas and then I said, Monday I'm going to I said, no, I'm not coming. Monday I'm going to Paris, she says I'm coming. <laughs> Monday I'm going to London, no one mind. Monday I'm going to LA or New York, she's coming. <laughs> it hurts you when your cell phone, which is a stupid thing about it, wherever she swipes, my cell phone goes. <laughs> 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 I'm, not sure, I'm sure a lot of people know your wife, and when they get to see her, they will understand. A former model, a teacher, an accomplished uh, actor herself. Matter of fact, you told her to stop acting. Did you think she's going to get the Oscar before you? <laughs> well, we didn't want competition in the house, right? No, we. Look. You, you don't have a meeting where these things are discussed. <laughs> Decisions are made and then uh, Umandi decided for her own that I will be the one who holds the I'm always accused of having attended a meeting in which meeting I asked her to stop. I don't remember the meeting. <laughs> Oh, she loves you. You know, as as I said to uh, as Mandi uh, said to her, what are the two things that you love, that, that that stands out about this man that you have gleaned from him over the years? And she said to me, tolerance and love. Wow. And she said to me, he loves me. <laughs> Well, somehow, life does something beautiful. It makes you bump into a partner, a situation, where things seem right, seems to be in the right place. And what's the strong part, I am not easily manageable. I am not easily tolerant. Somehow, I have a temperament that will tell you when I say no. Everybody who talks to me, the first response is no. Then you will work through your way to yes. <laughs> because I did not want to confuse my children into thinking that what we had and what we've achieved as a family came very easy. And they're constantly aware of the fact that there will be sunset one day for me, and I don't want them to be suffering because they never worked hard to build their own lives and to build their own independence. So some of these policies works for the Houten, for the Nozuko, uh, Nomonde. I have eight children and eight grandchildren. Wow. 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 And they're all beautiful and I love them all. Mm. I know they are saying no. <laughs> no, they all say yes. <laughs> they all say that's you know when I ask when I ask and try to clean generally what is it that they have learned from you? And, and they said resilience, commitment, pride, dignity, invincibility. And I especially loved when they said royalty. Wow. 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 John, That's uh, 76. 
a few innings. It's quite a few innings. It's quite a few innings. At the end of it all, how do you want everybody to remember you? Do you know when, when, at the, and, and, and you know, some kind of put it at that simpler when they asked him, how do you want them to remember you? And he said that my life has been useful. Mm. How do you want them to remember you? I cannot want to be remembered in any way because I still have to be 105. <laughs> every day, everything I do, everything I say, everything I'm engaged in is continuing to write the book I'm writing about my life. And never do I get to a point where I feel I'm nearer achieving what really is out there for me. I am hungry to better not my life, the lives of those that come into contact with me, the lives of those that are in the same environment that set it with me. It pains me to see a young, talented somebody who has the potential and is being frustrated by this country, by this, by this absolute go that's going on, that focus that we've taken away from what we promised in 1994. We've moved so far away from that. We've left these young people disillusioned. No wonder that they stroll into different beliefs and cultures at work. I still want to say to my brothers and sisters as well, we gotta go back to the beginning. Mm. There are people who are letting down. There are people who left this earth hoping that now that we're still alive, will continue carrying the torch for freedom and democracy. And John, you have done your bit. You know, when you speak to young people like Sipema, uh, Sipara, Sipemo, whether you speak to a uh, youngish Sipoma Buse or a youngish Silo Marke, they all speak so glowingly about you. Uh, Sipo says to me, I just want to say thank you. And he said to me, for 10 years, he trusted me and gave me no experience to run Kibis, the Jesla. And Silo said, just by creating the opportunity to be here, it's because of John Gunn. John, I think your legacy is going to be lived through and is going to be seen through what you've done for others more than what you do yourself. How you've been selfless, courageous, and always putting others before yourself. It's been a pleasure to have you this evening. I really want to thank you and to wish that you do go on until you are 105. Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Robert and I can play right the right hand and supreme king of Wakanda, John Kane! I really want to thank the market leader, James Marvel, especially the district director, who put together this incredible spectrum.